let's go ahead and get a start here. Um, we may have a few stragglers that, that come on here momentarily, but uh, let's let's make as much of this time as we can. Uh, my name is Luke Haynes, and you're here for the dry needling for thoracic outlet syndrome. Um, thoracic outlet syndrome, you know, it's a complex problem. Um, dry needling affords us an opportunity to address those structures that could otherwise be impinging on both the brachial plexus uh, as it uh, exits uh, the cervical spine running uh, through that canal, uh, as well as um, uh, the, the, the vascular structures as well. Uh, it can be, you know, thoracic outlet can be uh, either or both of those, um, either the neural bundle or the vascular bundle, or it can be both. Uh, fortunately, uh, the, the structures that would uh, provide that impingement, um, we can deal with those um, in, in the same manner. Um, so one of the most important parts is obviously, um, I mean, we don't just want to uh, identify somebody, well, I think they've got thoracic outlet, and then just grab some needles and stick them somewhere. Um, the, the important part is to, to identify uh, clinically what, what the structures are involved. Uh, dry needling definitely is not a substitute for, for uh, good clinical decision uh, making, uh, good assessment, uh, good planning. Uh, so we need to identify where we feel like uh, this, this impingement, this uh, compression is taking place. And um, as well, after we do the dry needling on these structures, uh, very critical to restore normal motion, normal, normal posture more than anything, and normal strength in, in that region. Uh, and so, again, dry needling, definitely a big part, but uh, not a, not, doesn't take away the need for the other pieces that we would want to look at. Uh, in regards to um, uh, treatment. So, um, so welcome to the, the, the little webinar. Um, you should, if you have questions, uh, feel free to hit the, um, hit the chat button uh, or whatever options we have down at the bottom of the screen. Uh, and I'll try to answer uh, those as, as time allows. Uh, I will say that um, uh, my, my, my willing participant for, for demo uh, was not able to actually be here today. Uh, fortunately, I do have some video of individual uh, needling of, of these muscles that we'll talk about, and so those will be available. Uh, at the conclusion, um, I will convert this over to a, um, a webinar that you can view on, on the YouTube channel. So uh, if you don't know where, where that is, uh, I can uh, send that, email me and I can send that to you. Uh, I also will, will try to send out uh, an email uh, either this evening or tomorrow of, with with the link to that as well. So uh, if you come in late or didn't even get a chance to, to watch, uh, that will content will be available uh, for viewing later. So, all right. So uh, again, I do this at the beginning of every webinar, uh, just a little rundown. Uh, some, some people are, are very experienced clinicians in dry needling. Uh, some people have never uh, looked at a needle before, so just a quick uh, overview. Uh, dry needling, uh, it's been used uh, by urine PTs, European PTs for decades. Uh, traditionally there it's referred to as acupuncture. Um, uh, dry needling uh, originated from the work of Janet Travell and our trigger point theory. Um, obviously uh, traditional Chinese acupuncture has been around for thousands of years. Um, I'm based in Texas, so a lot of what I do is um, talking about the, the, the legal aspect here in Texas. First formal training course in the US was in 97. Uh, Texas PT Association approved its first dry needling course in 08. And here we didn't get a definitive uh, AG opinion uh, on dry needling uh, until 2016, uh, placing dry needling fully within our scope of practice for physical therapists. Each state is gonna be a little bit different. There's still some uh, states on the East Coast, West Coast that uh, are slow and, and, and coming on board in that regard. Absolutely uh, try to stay involved, stay active with, with your state legislatures. Um, dry needling is a great tool for us to use. Uh, we just need to make sure that we own it in each state. Uh, how does dry needling work? Um, lots of, lots of uh, theory out there on, on how it works. Um, a lot of times, uh, so there's, there, there's a lot of, uh, the majority of research and the majority of uh, dry needling is centered around the trigger point. Uh, I'll be the absolute first to tell you that I'm not a trigger point guy. I don't look at trying to identify a particular uh, undefinable 
node in a muscle. And if I hit that, then that's my, my success spot. Um, I feel like we can do a much better job in being specific in the muscles that we're hitting and um, that the trigger point itself, uh, probably not as relevant as we once, once thought it was. Research actually holds out that getting that twitch response isn't all that critical. Uh, so uh, I, I, I look at it a little bit differently. I'm looking at decreasing inflammation in either the muscular tissue, the neural tissue, or, or the connective tissue as well. So that, that's really the, uh, the basis of where I'm looking at. But generally speaking, it's agreed that dry needling will increase blood flow in the area. It'll decrease the taut muscle banding uh, or, or the tenderness uh, uh, sensitivity associated with that. Um, it, uh, the decrease in the spontaneous electric, electrical activity or the twitch response. Um, some research, again, suggests that they not, may not be relevant. And then we also see uh, some central nervous uh, and some biochemical changes that can occur both distally and proximally uh, in regards to, to dry needling. So lots of, lots of uh, research out there. There's a whole lot more that needs uh, to still be done. Uh, contraindications, uh, obviously non-consent. If you're having to, to drag a patient into dry needling uh, by, by the arm, uh, odds are they won't be a great uh, candidate. Um, so uh, that consent part uh, is, is critical. Uh, some other things, first trimester of pregnancy, probably more of medical legal issue, um, nipples umbilicus, external uh, genitalia, um, uh, uncontrolled anticoagulant use, um, and, and a, a number of other uh, things there, uh, occipital region with somebody who has Chiari malformation. Some relative contraindications when we look at post-surgical, um, a good general frame of, of operation is if it's uh, just tissue that uh, communicates with the area of, of surgical intervention, six weeks is a good uh, time frame to, to wait before dry needling that. Uh, and if it's uh, specific to the area of, of, of surgery, uh, waiting 12 weeks uh, is also a good idea. Um, if, if your surgeon is familiar with the approach and is willing to uh, allow you to, to dry needle earlier, uh, that's our, ultimately um, up, up to the surgeon to make that determination. I've definitely uh, needled much earlier uh, in that case, uh, but always uh, getting surgeon's uh, consent on that. Uh, precautions, uh, needle aversion, phobia, um, someone that has some significant cognitive impairment. I uh, tell a story of a patient that I had that uh, definitely was cognitive, cognitively impaired, had, had some language issues, but was able to communicate uh, with, through his mother to me and um, so we were able to, to work around, you know, his pain response and so forth. But in general, if there's a significant cognitive impairment, they are unable to really communicate with you that it makes it a little bit challenging there. Uh, additional precautions, um, if, if we're on the torso, we'll talk about pec minor in a moment. Uh, there, you want to be cognizant of if there's a breast implant, uh, doesn't mean you can't do it. You just have to be uh, aware of what that border is. The last thing we want to do is needle into, um, um, uh, an implant like that. Uh, uh, similarly, um, when we're talking about the lung field, um, pneumothorax becomes um, the big the big one. That's the one we want to stay away from. So with thoracic outlet syndrome, we want to look at um, the different potential structures that, that could be creating this compression onto brachial plexus and that, that vascular bundle as it's uh, traveling laterally. Um, pec minor uh, is, um, is almost always a big culprit, as is uh, the short head of the bicep and possibly even deeper to that, uh, the coracobrachialis. All three of those obviously attaching onto uh, the coracoid process. Um, a secondary location uh, would be on uh, of serratus anterior and the upper traps. I include those because those are big, powerful uh, movers and they control a lot of the movement of, of the shoulder blade, the scapula itself. And, and so those get um, those need to be addressed similarly. Uh, anytime that there's some uh, neuromuscular tension in that area, if we don't release that, it's gonna make the deeper structures a little bit more complicated. Uh, tertiary, similar scapular movers and stabilizers, the rhomboids, levator scap. Levator scap is, is one of, one of the, the, the critical muscles in the cervical to shoulder uh, junction, uh, anything that happens there. Levator seems to be involved uh, quite a bit, and it can be a, a significant uh, generator of pain in that area. 
Uh, and then lastly, the, the deep cervical, uh, the scalenes, the anterior and middle scalene, uh, we'll look at a 3D anatomy um, in just a second. Um, but, but because that brachial plexus exits so closely to that, uh, any inflammation in those tissues could provide that compression around those structures as well, uh, a little bit deeper onto the inferior belly of the omohyoid. Uh, omohyoid is one that's uh, it's a challenging um, needle application. Uh, and we'll, we'll look at it on 3D anatomy as, as why, that, why that is such. Uh, but there are still ways that we can get to that and make a, a good clinical uh, treatment on that. So again, all of those muscles definitely part of, I didn't include in there uh, posterior scaling. It, it can also be an impact as, as one of the muscles that, that ra helps raise and lower the first, uh, the first rib and, uh, and, and, and creates a space or compression again of, of those structures um, and, and that, that's responsible for thoracic outlet. So pec, uh, the primary locations, uh, again, pec minor, short head bicep, coracobrachialis, everything that comes over and attaches onto the um, coracoid process. Again, the, um, the brachial plexus and the vascular bundle sits uh, posterior to that. Um, probably not the main areas that compress, but as from a postural standpoint, they do a, a, a big number on, on really bringing that shoulder girdle down. Uh, inferiorly. Uh, secondarily, again, the big movers, uh, serratus anterior and the upper trapezius, uh, because they play such a role in, in the control and maneuver, maneuverability of that scapula. Um, very important there. Again, this is another one of those situations where dry needling alone is not going to be the, the solution. It's a great way to release that neuromuscular tension, but then we definitely need to get in there and get our hands on that scapula and start mobilizing that and, and all the available motions uh, to, to give those uh, that neurovascular bundle room to breathe and let it function properly. And similarly, uh, the rhomboids, uh, major and minor, and the levator scap. Um, and more about the control of, of the scapula, but that is a huge piece when it comes to uh, the thoracic outlet is control and maneuverability of that. If you get a situation where you have uh, a stuck uh, or a sick scapula, if you will, um, those are always going to be involved. So mobilizing those after dry needling is uh, very, uh, very helpful. And then on the deep cervical component. So in, in this little slide, um, I've got highlighted the inferior uh, omohyoid and the middle uh, anterior and the middle uh, scalene. Uh, they're the same color at the moment because they're highlighted as brachial plexus as it, as it exits right here. But they are so close, so intimately related uh, to these structures um, that they become quite, quite critical in, in, in managing, especially if the site of entrapment is more uh, at the cervical spine. Again, it can be at the cervical spine. It can be under, uh, above the, the rib. It can be, um, it can even be a little bit further distally. Uh, but if it's over uh, next to the spine, we're gonna have to deal with, with those muscles as well. Um, exercise, stretching, um, lots of different ways, contract, relax, that the, the we can release those if they will. If it's too far, uh, dry needling is definitely a great way to, uh, to alleviate that. So let me move um, into the 3D anatomy because um, I'm, I'm a firm believer in, in, in looking at uh, 3D anatomy to, to really get a good sense of what's going on in there. So let me bring that up real quick. All right, so, and we'll look at it here on the, on the right side of the model. So you can see uh, brachial plexus uh, exiting out uh, of, of the cervical spine, uh, five, six, seven, eight. And you see the middle scaling and the anterior scaling. Well, there's not, there's just not a whole lot of room in there. If we get a significant amount of, of inflammation. And, and with inflammation, again, my approach is I want to decrease the inflammation, whether it's uh, here in the scalings, whether it's uh, in the shoulder for, say, impingement. Uh, anytime a muscle is, is inflamed, it's going to be, it's going to take up more space. It's going to have more mass um, or, or, or occupy more space. And because there's so little uh, room to give there, that can be uh, a problem with that. So Big, big players right there. 
Um, one that's a little bit more challenging to deal with is inferior belly of the omohyoid. Now, as, as we look at that, um, there, it, it really sits right on top of that brachial plexus. And so if there's some, some neuromuscular tension in that, um, that, that can create an issue as well. I would rarely ever think that the omohyoid would be acting alone. I would expect to see uh, either, either and or the, the scalenes or the, the muscles more laterally uh, being involved. Uh, but we'll, we'll talk a little bit about how to needle that and how, how I've oriented this picture right here. Um, to be honest, the way, the way you get to it is you have to be very specific on your location, but you're basically going to split between uh, the, the, the inferior, I mean, the, the superficial and the deep uh, internal, uh, internal superficial uh, jugular vein. Uh, so you split between that to get to the inferior belly, as well as the anterior scalene. Uh, you have to be cautious, obviously, with the neurovascular bundle. That is not a, a dry needling location that I'd recommend for uh, anybody that uh, is, is new to the game that doesn't have a whole lot going on as far as experience there. Again, a lot of structures here, a lot of potential for problems if you're not aware of, of your three-dimensional anatomy of your uh, location of your, 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 your structures. Um, and here we get into very specific um, needle placement by uh, other surface anatomy to, to tell us exactly where that is going to be. So um, really important subject uh, area right there. Um, included subclavius, I like the needle subclavius just because it's fun. How clinically relevant is it? Uh, probably not all that much, but it does have a role uh, in, in that first rib and the, and the location of, of, the, of the clavicle. Um, again, moving further out, um, symptomatically, uh, pec minor is, is always going to be a, a very tender uh, muscle whenever we're dealing with thoracic outlet. Uh, you will see it also in the short head of the bicep. Uh, because of its location, coracobrachialis right behind it, uh, very easy. Matter of fact, it's rather difficult not to needle coraco at the same time. Um, and so very, very often we'll, we'll hit, hit a few of the prime movers here. Um, and so uh, the nuts and bolts, be, be aware because of uh, a good dry needling approach to uh, thoracic outlet, more than likely will involve the lateral uh, part of the neck. Uh, we wanna be very specific and very cautious of how we do that needling. That being said, I've needled it hundreds of times and have had no uh, issues simply because I follow the rules and needle placement orientation and angulation. So uh, 3D anatomy approach right there. Uh, so let's jump back, go back to my share again. Let's see where we are. All right. So for the protocol, I'll just kind of run through this a little bit. Um, again, uh, primary, secondary, tertiary locations. Never a bad idea because we know uh, the location of the spinal segments where uh, the cervical spine is going. Never a bad idea to hit um, a deep um, spinal segment uh, at, at, onto the lamina um, at, at the appropriate levels. Here would be C5 down to T1, but you can include a little bit more if you wanted to, but just trying to stimulate uh, any sort of neural response uh, would be helpful for that. Um, Okay, so the first picture just shows uh, the primary um, pec minor, short head of the bicep, coracobrachialis, um, got upper traps up here as well. Um, and then here coming back for, um, here you've got your rhomboids, uh, levator. Um, you can also go underneath. So for, for serratus anterior, uh, we can catch it um, either on the anterior surface of the scapula or uh, I'd have to go back, let me go back. Uh, we could catch it on the ribs themselves on, on the lateral aspect of the trunk. If and only if we're able to palpate and have absolute certainty of needle location. Um, trunk is very uh, problematic area. If we're not 100% positive of our, of, our, of our background, of our backdrop of where we wanna needle that, just getting started never a bad idea to needle that on the anterior surface of the scapula. Nice thing is you also get subscap, you get, um, 
you're, you're going to catch uh, the rhomboids as well if you do it that way. So you can get more bang for your buck, and and, and you can be certain of of the of the, of the, the precautions as well. For the upper trapezius, patient again is going to be in the prone position. Needle length here is going to be 40 to 60 millimeters. There is no backdrop. We're going to palpate for the thickest aspect of the muscle belly. Uh, we're going to grasp the muscle between the thumb posteriorly and the fingers anteriorly, at least one thumb breadth above the supraclavicular margin to avoid the apex of the lung. We're going to insert the needle into the muscle in a posterior to anterior trajectory using the fingers opposite the insertion point as a guide to determine needle depth. For the serratus anterior, position is going to be prone. We're going to have a needle length of about three centimeters. Uh, it could be a little bit more on, on this approach. Uh, the backdrop is going to be the anterior surface of the scapula. With the patient's hand behind their back, we're going to use a profundus grip to pull the medial border of the scapula away from the chest wall and needle to, needle, needle to the anterior surface of the scapula with periosteal pegging if necessary. Alternatively, serratus anterior can also be needled directly onto the lateral ribs uh, from four to nine at the origin of the muscle. Do not attempt that if you cannot palpate the borders of the ribs and needle only one centimeter. We are good. For the longissimus services, the iliocostalis services, the middle and posterior scalene. Uh, position, patient is going to be positioned in the sideline position. Needle length is going to be only about two centimeters. Uh, the backdrop here is going to be the articular pillar of C4 and C5. So precautions here, uh, the brachial plexus, the vertebral artery, common carotid artery, the external internal jugular vein. For this, we're going to palpate midway between the clavicle and the mandible uh, for the articular pillar. You should be able to differentiate between the pillar and the transverse process, which will sit more anterior. We're going to note the anterior and posterior drop off. We're going to needle at C4 or C5, direct perpendicular to the articular pillar, lateral to medial with a 10 to 15 degree anterior to posterior angulation to avoid the brachial plexus and the vascular structures. For the anterior scaling, position is going to be supine with the head rotated slightly contralateral. Needle depth is only going to be two centimeters, less than three centimeters. There is no backdrop here. Uh, precautions, important internal and external jugular veins, uh, the common carotid artery, the brachial plexus, and the vagal nerve. We're going to use the second and third fingers. We're going to pull the, the clavicular border of the sternocleidomastoid medially about one finger breadth. We're going to divide the SEM into thirds and at the superior margin of the distal third at the lateral SEM border, we're going to needle in a partially medial angulation about 15 degrees to enter the target muscle bisecting the jugular vein. Caution to avoid excessive depth due to the neurovascular structures.
So if I were to uh, specifically try to identify what the most important um, muscles are, um, when, 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 I, when I dry needle this, I'm probably gonna start with the upper trap and pec minor. Um, they're gonna give me my biggest bang for my buck. Um, if, 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 there's, if they're symptomatic in those two areas, a lot of times we can, we can needle those and go ahead and start uh, traditional therapy, some, uh, some, some big joint mobilization of the, of the scapula thoracic joint, uh, making sure that all of the, the, the muscles are firing and, and, and functioning properly. Uh, if I still don't see a response, then I'm gonna get a little bit deeper into uh, the, the muscles there on the lateral aspect uh, of the neck. Um, uh, the scalenes, um, inferior uh, omohyoid, um, and, and some of those that are just sitting right in there. Uh, but by and large, that's a great way to get a, a muscular release. Uh, start reteaching the patient how to, 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 to bring that shoulder blade up and back, uh, take that pressure off of that neurovascular bundle as it's running through. And, and so often that, that is a great way of providing that uh, relief right there. Uh, clinically, I see, see good results with, with using that um, as long as that patient is going to be compliant and doing what we need them to do as well. And that's restoring that posture uh, that's really the culprit behind compressing uh, that, that neurovascular bundle. So let's talk, <coughs> excuse me, really quickly, dosage and frequency. And if you've set for, for my webinars before, uh, this will be um, old, old news. How do you determine dosage and frequency? Uh, most definitely it's uh, patient specific, uh, but I divide into five categories and dosage and frequency uh, determined on their activity level, chronicity of the condition, and the response to treatment. Most important <clears throat> factor always is their compliance to a well-developed home exercise program. It's really easy for us to get out there as, as dry needlers, as therapists, uh, to want to just hit that muscle one time and it's fixed and everything is good to go. And there is a small window of patients that that does apply to, uh, but the majority of us, it, it's different. And it really is about uh, the exercise, the strength, the flexibility, the functional movement of, of whichever body system we're talking about, in this case, uh, thoracic outlet. It's incredibly important that they've got to do their part in to, main, to, to get it functioning how it needs to and to maintain it long term. Um, so the five approaches um, or types. Number one is the athlete. And there are two, two classifications in the athlete. One is a, a, an athlete that has no morbidi comorbidities. The issue is new and we're gonna see them within the first 10 days of an injury. Here they've not had a significant, uh, significant deviation from their strength or performance level. Uh, frequency of dry needling here, one to three sessions within three to five days. We're gonna hit it, we're gonna move, and there's nothing going on that, that shouldn't allow them to have an excellent prognosis and resume normal training and performance within two to four days. Uh, let's see here. There we go. Uh, the second type is they have one or more comorbidities. So uh, they thought this injury would go away. It's, uh, the issue is now moved to a subacute stage. It's 14 days plus, and they've begun to have asymmetries in their strength and performance. Here we're gonna probably need to dry needle three to six times within the first three weeks. Uh, again, prognosis is excellent, but they will need two to three weeks of training to restore any of those asymmetries they were dealing with, and then they can resume their performance training. The second one is the average Joe or your weekend warrior. Here, this person, they're in decent physical state, uh, shape. They had some incident resulted in a strain or an overuse injury, localized muscle or group of muscles. Um, we're gonna dry needle them one to three sessions within the first three to five days. Prognosis, again, is excellent. Uh, they will need to adapt to an ongoing HEP to address the mechanical deficit that set them up for the injury. So um, definitely they weren't a, an athletic, uh, finely tuned machine, but they were getting out there, they were doing something and something happened. Uh, and so for that problem to go away, they're gonna have to work on um, whatever HEP we put together uh, to keep it, uh, to, to get it back to normal function. Okay, we, then we got the quick stick. The quick stick, this is your work colleague. This is somebody who slept wrong, somebody who just needs a quick fix. Um, here, the frequency of, of needling, we're gonna hit them on time. Uh, prognosis is fair. And the reason I, I say that it's just a fair prognosis is there's gonna be some underlying condition that really needs compliance with, a, with an HEP 
to correct that, but they won't be willing to accept that fact or be willing to do the work. Uh, decent chance this person will become the procrastinator. And so mo most, most of us fall into this quick stick category. We want a quick fix. We want it done. We don't have time. Listen, we're, we're, we're clinicians. We're busy. Uh, we, we've got families. We've got, we've got things going on. Uh, and so we don't really take the time to focus on one particular issue. Uh, I had a problem with, uh, with a shoulder that it probably was uh, four weeks before I finally got somebody to, to, to needle it for me. Um, the problem is that, well, I just wanted it to be needled. I'm, I'm not going to do the work to, to make it stay in good shape, which, which I should, which means I'll probably end up being the procrastinator. But um, so that's, that's what we have there, the quick stick. And then down to the procrastinator. Here we have one to three comorbidities. Uh, this person's been dealing with the pain and function complaint for several years. They're unable, unwilling to deal with the issue due to a variety of either valid or invalid reasons. Now they've decided to do something about the problem. So this person, uh, they've, uh, they're going to be dry needle probably eight to 12 sessions within the first 30 days. Uh, good prognosis. Uh, success is definitely going to be dependent on compliance with the HEP. Again, dry needling is fantastic for reducing neuromuscular tension, for getting rid of that tenderness. Uh, but what it won't do without intervention is restore movement, restore strength, restore function. And so that's, that's the important part there. Finally, we have the hard case. Uh, here there are multiple, multiple comorbidities. Uh, so this is your, your severe OA, DJD, other issues. They really, they need surgical intervention uh, or intervention that can't be done due to either a medical or personal issue, such as not being able to get cleared for surgery due to pulmonary or cardiac reasons. Here, our frequency of dry needling. Um, first 30 days, we're gonna hit them hard and heavy. Eight to 12 sessions, we're gonna see if we can't get a good hold <coughs> on the pain that they're dealing with. For that second 30 days, we're gonna drop that down considerably. Uh, four to eight sessions with that. And then for that third month and then beyond, we may see them two to four times during that, that, that intervening time. Um, again, they can't have surgery. Um, there's significant um, damage that's been done and we just want to control pain. Uh, here, prognosis, it's fair. And honestly, this is long-term maintenance. Um, insurance may be an, an issue. It may require a cash pay arrangement. Uh, and then treatment will be required until interventional clearance is obtained. So we're not fixing anything here and um, there's gonna be issues, uh, but basically it's non-pharmacological pain management. And some, some clinicians, some therapists feel feel uneasy using that terminology. However, I look at it as we can manage that pain or they can go to the pain docs and, and get on Oxycontin or the high, the, the high farm pain management. You know, at least if they're doing it our way, we know that they're getting some movement, they're getting some non-medicinal treatment going on. So I personally feel like that it's a lot better if we can do it. Um, you'll, you'll run into the struggles with your pain management docs over this. Um, most of them, my experience, they're, they're not going to be all that excited about referring to us heavily anyway, because if we can make them better, then why would they go to the pain docs? So uh, again, non-pharmacological pain management uh, dosage may have to be adjusted based on their condition. Uh, the treatment should improve functional outcomes, but withdrawing or discharging uh, the service that we have in place will result and return to prior condition. Uh, limit improvement would be, um, th there would be limit improvement with a progressive HEP. So uh, thoracic outlet, that, that's basically what I look at. Again, it's not a dry needling is, is not a substitute for good therapy. Uh, it lets us manage and control these, uh, the neuromuscular tension in all the muscles that are at the lateral aspect of the neck as the brachial plexus exits here and between collarbone and the rib cages, they're exiting further down. A lot of good potential uh, muscles that we can address and reduce that uh, to help our patient get that motion and control back in that area. Um, so um, I'm gonna reach out to my co-presenter, see if there's any questions that she wasn't able to, to manage. Um, there and I'm talking to her. While she's coming on, um, I will tell you a little bit. Uh, I get a lot of questions about what are what is our coursework going to look like for 2021. Um, 
boy, that's, that's hard to say. I basically have turned everything just into webinars and so forth for, for 2020 um, because it's hard to know uh, what, what things are going to look like. Uh, we, 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 we may have some in-person uh, courses next year. Uh, I, I am in the process of, uh, I hope by the end of the year, I will have all of the content of my three uh, certification courses into an online format. Um, basically, I have a single course and then 10 more subsequent after that for each zone of the body. Uh, so uh, there's, there's a lot more that I get into uh, in that, obviously, than in the webinars. Uh, but I hope to have a more of a, an idea of how, how the, the education piece is going to look next year before in the next couple of weeks. Um, I would like to see us just get to, um, you know, full online live course, uh, coursework. Uh, just really challenging right now with confusion over where we are with um, the virus and so forth. So uh, upcoming webinars, I didn't update this. The last one for the year will be uh, December the 8th there, where we're gonna talk about Pez and Serene Versitis. Uh, I will, and that will be at uh, noon central time on December the 8th. I, I will have this uh, recorded into um, YouTube format basically, and I'll get that link out to anybody uh, who registered for the, the, court, uh, the webinar and, and, and listened today. Uh, so if you do have any questions, uh, you can reach out to me, uh, HanesPTInstitute.com. Um, you can go to drydealing.org. That'll point straight to uh, our website. And um, any questions, just let me know. Otherwise, I uh, hope to see you again uh, this time in about a month when we talk about PAS bursitis.